Shalom and finally welcome back to Che Languages. Where was I? Short answer, I was in Israel. I even took the photo that's the thumbnail of this video. The long answer, it doesn't really matter and a lot has happened, but what does matter is that I am back today. As you can see from the title, we're going to talk about five language isolates today. What is a language isolate? Some may be asking. Well, it's simply a language that is not related to any other language, or at least not known to be related. Some famous examples of this are the Basque language in Western Europe and the ancient Sumerian language, which is still a mystery today, as it was not related to any of the Semitic languages in the area, nor to ancient Persian in its east. However, all the languages we will discuss today are living and around the entire globe. Yala matrilim. This section is actually a first for the channel. Despite the fact I've wanted to talk about them for so long, we've never actually covered a language spoken on the continent of South America. Although large language families exist in this linguistically rich part of the world, we'll start with a language isolate by the name of Guarao or sometimes Guarauno or Guarao. There are people on the north coast of Venezuela, Guiana and Suriname, and the language is spoken in this area. There are about 30,000 speakers of Warao today, and the language is actually well known for its unusual word order, that being object, subject, verb, which less than 0.1% of the world's languages use. Strangely enough, the small handful of languages that use OSV are all located in South America, despite the fact that most of them are not at all related. But it's possible that this is because of long language contacts, regardless of whether they are related or not. Still, this doesn't stop certain linguists from trying to classify them together. And this has led to the Waroid hypothesis, which states that the languages of Taino, Guanahatabe, and Makori, sometimes Makoris, are all related. What makes this interesting is that all of these languages are located, or were located in the case of some, on islands in the Caribbean whereas Warao is restricted to the coast. This doesn't mean that the hypothesis should be ruled out completely, but given that two of the four languages hypothesized to be linked are now extinct, it makes it hard to actually test further if they were indeed linked and generally makes the hypothesis weak, meaning an isolate is the best answer we're going to get. Warao itself is a beautiful sounding language having a surprisingly small consonant inventory as shown here. And I also have a list of words. The language is not often written, but you can find videos of people speaking it if you want better examples. If anyone happens to speak an indigenous language in South America, preferably close to the region, let me know if you see any overlap. There shouldn't be any, but it would be interesting to see if any possible links exist. For now, however, we're going to move on to our next language isolate of the video. Sticking in America, but this time North America we have one of the many indigenous languages spoken in Mexico. However, unlike most Mesoamerican languages, this one doesn't actually share any link with them. The language here is Purepecha, also commonly called Purepecha and historically called Tarasco, the name the Spanish colonizers used for them. They are focused around the area of Michoacán, but also spill out into the neighboring states of Jalisco. Also, the Purepecha people officially have their own flag, but with no offence to the Purepecha people, it looks absolutely dreadful. Though I do always like to see the addition of Tyrrhenian purple on flags. Purepecha surprisingly boasts a number of 140,000 speakers, which is unusual for language isolates, which tend to usually be marginalised. And the survey was relatively recent. The Jewish American linguist Josef Greenberg hypothesized that Purepecha was part of the Chipchan languages, which are an indigenous language family that spread uh, from Honduras all the way down to Colombia. Greenberg's proposal has been rejected by other linguists, and though the Chipchan language family has been proved, there is no good evidence to show that Purepecha is actually a part of it. Regardless, unlike some governments, <coughs> France, Mexico are impressively good at preserving their indigenous languages. Thus, Purepecha has been designated as one of the national languages. 
and one can find many bilingual schools in Michoacán. Budapest's vowel inventory is simple and features a so-called Slavic short I, or U, whereas its consonant inventory is much more complex. However, most of the scary looking sounds are in reality just aspirated consonants with the exception of the difficult R, written as RH, in Budapest orthography. More about that in a second. One thing that stuck out to me in the consonant inventory was the distinction between aspirated and unaspirated ts and ch, something that I've only ever seen in Georgian. But I should probably stop talking about that before the Dene Caucasian fanboys take over the comment section. It's also important to note that the use of the acute accent is used to distinguish words with stress. For example, the words karani, which means to write, and karani, to fly, are completely different and completely dependent on the stress, which again is marked with an acute accent. Purepecha has a colonial Spanish-based orthography, preserving the use of X for the SH sound, or PSH, just as medieval Spanish did. A few indigenous languages in Mexico preserve this orthographical feature, as do some languages in Spain itself, such as Catalan and Galician. The alphabet is called Purepecha Jimbo Cararacuecha, and here is Omniglot's version if you want to see exactly how the sounds are transcribed. For Purepecha, I managed to find the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, again on Omniglot. And the first thing I noticed is that the words Quiripecha and Purepecha are similar. Uh, if I was to guess, Pecha or Puecha means people, but that is just a guess. Before I finish the section, I just want to take a minute to appreciate their culture. Before the arrival of Cristoforo Colombo, the Purepecha Empire spread across much of modern-day Michoacán and neighboring states, and was a powerful enemy to the Aztecs, able to repel their invasions time and time again. The empire was able to last up to almost 40 years after the arrival of the Spanish in the Americas, up until 1530 CE. I find this really inspiring given that they were not related to any other people in the region, as an isolate, they founded a powerful empire that outlived the Aztec Empire by almost a decade, and they produced some amazing pieces of art and ornaments, as well as building impressive pyramids and structures. Still today, modern place names in Michoacán, such as Tinsunzan, their capital, and the location of the pyramid in the photo, derive from the Puripecha language. They are definitely an underrated culture. But for now, we're going to move on to the next language of today. Moving on now to Asia, where between these beautiful mountains, a mysterious language isolate is spoken. It's called Burushaski, and is spoken between Pakistan and India, but mainly concentrated in the Hunza Valley region, with these communities shown on the map. Again, impressively, there are between 112,000 to 126,000 speakers of the language. And in Pakistan, the language is focused in the Hunza, Nagar, Yasin, Ishkoman, and Gilgit valleys, whereas in India it spread across the Kargil and Leh valleys in Jammu and Kashmir, and additionally some more speakers in Ladakh and Srinagar, totaling at some 300 speakers. So it's safe to say that it's much more widely spoken in Pakistan. I have more to say about the origins of the language, but we'll get to that later. First, Burushaski features a very rich consonant inventory, with some incredibly unique sounds such as this interesting L sound, the weird D found in Hungarian, written as GY in Hungarian, or Madjar. Furthermore, they're not a difficult sound to make. I don't think I've ever seen an aspirated A before. And it's interesting that Burushaski makes a distinction between the aspirated and unaspirated variants. Burushaski only has a simple five vowel inventory of your standard A, E, I, or U. In day-to-day -day life, Burushaski is written in the Perso-Arabic alphabet, and yes, it is a full alphabet, which makes it a hundred times easier to read properly. But for those who struggle with Arabic script, there is also an accepted romanization. I'd also like to mention that Burushaski has a unique set of five grammatical cases that make it difficult to classify with any other languages in the surrounding area. Returning back to the romanization, all the examples I could find don't seem to use his Latin script, strangely enough. Speaking of which, Language Museum provides this example, and then there is also a huge comparison list that I will link in the description that shows the differences between some of the dialects found around these different valleys in northern Pakistan and India. 
what is shown here is not even half of the list. So before we finish this section, I want to talk about some of the different theories for the origins of Bolshevsky. The most sensible and linguistically accepted answer is that it's a language isolate, which is why Bolshevsky has its own section in this video. Whether they are true or not, the theories are much more interesting. The first one that caught my eye, especially considering my previous video, is that Bolshevsky is a North Caucasian language. Now, as anyone who watched my last video will know, North Caucasian is not a language family. It's already a controversial grouping of the two separate Northwest Caucasian and Northeast Caucasian language families, which are widely agreed to have no relation at all. To make this even worse, the linguist John D. Bengston hypothesized in 2019 that Burushaski may indeed be a North Caucasian language. But the theories don't stop there. Another one proposed by Eric B. Hamp and later supported by Ilya Chashule states that Burushaski is an Indo-Hittite language. This is, itself is once again a controversial proposed language family that includes the Hittite language along with other Indo-European Anatolian languages and the mysterious Indo-European Phrygian language. The theory is that Phrygian and Anatolian languages share an ancestor with a pre-Proto-Indo-European language, but they split off from it much earlier before it even became Proto-Indo-European, basically saying that these languages are much older than previously assumed. Hamp takes uh, this another step further, however, and hypothesizes that Burushaski may have similarly been part of this split. And Chashule even mentions a possible link with the now extinct Tocharian languages, which were Indo-European languages in the region I've mentioned before. More information is provided in the top corner of the screen now. Believe it or not, this is still not the craziest theory about Burushaski, as of course at some point we're talking about language isolates, we always have to talk about the Dene Caucasian language family. Bengston once again proposed this and got support from other Dene Caucasian hypothesis fans, but he also went a step further, stating that he believes Burushaski to be one of the primary branches along with North Caucasian and Yeniseen. The Dene Caucasian languages deserve a video of their own, as it's such a hot topic in linguistics. And just to show how crazy it is, here's a map of the supposed language family. Yeah, I know. But anyway, the final theory is that Burushaski is part of the proposed Karasuk language family, which includes exclusively Burushaski and the Yeniseen language family, or rather just language, as the rest have died out now, leaving behind only Ket. This does seem strange at first, but there is evidence that the original Yeniseen homeland was actually in the region of the Burushaski language before they migrated northwards into Siberia. And the enigmatic Karasuk culture, a Bronze Age culture for which the hypothesis is named after, is believed to have been composed ethnically of Yeniseen people, despite being thousands of miles away. Furthermore, there is an impressive list of similar vocabulary between Borushaski and Kit. But before I finish talking about this, now is a good time to mention one of my new favourite language YouTubers. Quote, I'm Sean, get off my lawn. We recently made a video about Kit and the Dene Yenisen language family, which is just slightly more accepted than the Dene Caucasian hypothesis. This video, and his channel as a whole, is definitely worth checking out, and if you love the content I make, you'll love his channel just as much, as most of his videos are focused on endangered and lesser known languages. Anyway, let's finally move on to another language isolate that's spoken in disputed Indian territory. Again, we find ourselves in a place that is disputed with India, where we find the Poroik language. However, this is on the other side of India to Burushaski, in the region of Arunachal Pradesh in eastern India. This territory is disputed with China, but is under the administration of India and is culturally much closer to India. However, this culture is not Indian at all, as the Poroik people form an isolate and their origins are unknown. This story is much more short and much more sad. They only have 20,000 speakers and they are spread around Arunachal Pradesh and a small community is also over the border in Tibet. Sadly, less than 2% of speakers of Poroik are literate, meaning it's even harder for this language to be passed down and preserved. 
Podoic's phonology is unique in both consonants and vowels. And I find it really interesting that Podoic has the Welsh L or L as it's such a rare sound. Sadly, there aren't many written samples of Podoic as it's not commonly written down as I mentioned before. But there are plenty of videos available. Omniglots does provide this list of numbers, however, so this is the only sample I can give you in this video. Please let me know if there are any similarities with your language if you are watching this from Northeast India or Tibet. But for now, let's talk about the final language for today. The final language that we will be talking about today is called Sandawi, a language isolate spoken in Tanzania. The flag shown here is just the proposed flag made by language fans online as the people have no actual official flag themselves. But the language is spoken in this general area in Tanganyika, or continental Tanzania. Despite the fact that Sandawe is the most widely spoken language isolate on the continent of Africa, it has only 60,000 speakers as per a survey from over a decade ago. However, modern estimates give or take 30,000 speakers and place the number from anywhere as little as 30,000 to anywhere as large as 90,000 speakers. This language is called Sandawe Kiing, both speakers, and Greenberg once again tried classifying uh, it as part of some larger language family, this time being Khoi Kwadi, or basically the Khoisan languages plus another poorly attested ambiguous isolate called Kwadi that was spoken in Angola but is now extinct since around 1960. Even maps like this that supposedly show the Khoisan languages also show Sandawe along with another language isolate spoken closely nearby called Hadza, which some more likely theories state may be related to Sandawe, meaning it's possible neither are, neither are isolates, but rather form their own Hadza Sandawe language family, though this has not yet been proven. Nonetheless, most maps of the Khoisan language family include Sandawe these days, despite neither theory being fully proven. It is claimed that the original Khoisan homeland was located around the area in which Sandawe is now spoken, and thus that the Sandawe people themselves simply never moved from it. Either way, it's safe to assume that Sandawe is a language isolate for now. Sandawe's vowel inventory is very simple, but the same cannot be said for their consonants, which sport some very unique phonemes that even I cannot even attempt to replicate, such as this here, which appears to be the Hungarian dja, coupled with another weird L sound, making some incredibly difficult to pronounce DL la sound. If you think the consonants are the hard part, wait until you see the clicks. Click sounds are the main reason that Sandawe gets linked with the Khoisan languages, as it is a unique feature they share that could hint towards a possible shared origin. However, once again, the Southern Bantu languages also developed cliques supposedly from contact with Khoisan languages, so it doesn't necessarily mean that Sandawe is related to the Khoisan language family purely because of click sounds. As you can see, the cliques have their own orthographical representation, and this is because Sandawe orthography is inspired and more or less taken directly from both the Zulu and Osa languages of Sudafrika. Despite the official overview I found showing that Sandawe has only five vowels, I have noticed that the orthography also shows a presence of nasal vowels, which are still vowels in their own right, as long as they're not allophones of the standard vowels. Sadly, I was not able to find any proper samples of Sandawe in action, but Wikipedia does have these examples of vocabulary, which is all I can get. I will link videos of Sandawe being spoken, if I can find any, as I get a feeling it, that it exists mainly as an oral language, as opposed to a written one. For now, however, that's it for Sandawe, and that's all we have time for today. That's all for today. I hope you enjoyed this video and found the topic fascinating. I hope to be back for good now, but I probably won't be back to the old schedule of uploading every two weeks, so we'll have to see for now. Either way, I'm glad to be back here on YouTube and I would appreciate it if you could show my channel some support. But for now, I hope to see you again in the next video and thank you for watching. Yalla litrot.